Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm the Pre Sarah Rosen Mortel. I have the great honor of being the president of the Urban Institute and of uh, saying hello to our online audience and to those who are here with us in person. Before I start, let me do a few housekeeping um, items. As I mentioned, this is a hybrid event, so we have guests with us online as well. And if you're joining us online, you have closed captions enabled, and you can submit questions or comments for the speakers in the Q&A box. For those of you who are in the room and you want to submit, please use the QR codes on your tables to submit questions, and they'll get merged with those for the online audience. This event is being recorded, and the recording and relevant links will be posted online after the event. We'll also be sharing a post-event survey, and we ask that you share your feedback with us. It really helps us to make these events more uh, successful in the future. If you would like to join the conversation online, we ask you as your uh, whatever social media platform you may be in on, uh, use the hashtag live at urban. That helps other people who are in the conversation join you as well. I'm really excited to welcome you today uh, for an in conversation, important conversation right now, especially about lowering costs for American families. We're going to hear from a leader in economic policy from the Biden administration about the work that they've been doing and then have a discussion with people from the Urban Institute and um, Consumer Federation of America about other ideas and most importantly, why this matters so much to the American people. We're very excited to have uh, CFA, Consumer Federation of America, partnering with us today, and also that the National Economic Council's uh, advisor, assistant to the president, Lael Brainerd, is here with us. I'm also excited to announce the launch of a new data tool from the Urban Institute's Financial Wellbeing Data Hub that will allow users to find the financial well-being metrics um, that, they, that are important to their needs and from all kinds of publicly available data sources, whether that's from the census, the ACS, the Federal Reserve, uh, surveys that Urban ourselves is, is doing, things from the Financial Pulse Survey, lots of different sources. But if you want a source for understanding what's happening for wealth or credit availability, credit access, other things, you can find it there. And I think that'll make much more easily accessible and available to a broader part of the audience, information that has once only really been available to um, researchers. And we hope that researchers, policymakers, and other decision makers will use the tool to better understand how the topics that we're here to discuss today, the affordability of food, healthcare, transportation, housing, et cetera, shape households' financial well-being. Because it's only with a better understanding of the complexity of how Americans live their financial lives that stakeholders across the ecosystem develop solutions to ensure that all people have the resources they need to thrive. I can't think of a better partner for this conversation or that mission than our friends at the Consumer Federation of America. CFA is at the forefront of efforts to advance consumer interests through research, advocacy, and education focusing on the important issues of our time related to economic justice, consumer protection, insurance, food security, and much more. Urban and CFA have a long history of partnership. It's primarily been in the area of housing finance with their senior advisor, Barry Zegas, been a core partner of ours as we launched the Housing Finance Policy Center now 10 years ago. And we're really honored to be hosting this event with CFA. And so I'd like to invite Susan Weinstock, their CEO, to the the podium and she'll introduce our speaker. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Sarah, appreciate it. I am Susan Weinstock, uh, President and CEO of the Consumer Federation of America and welcome to our event. We're thrilled to have you here. Uh, I want to thank the Urban Institute for co-hosting this event with us today, and to Dr. Leo Brainerd, uh, Director of the White House Nas National Economic Council, for inviting us to be part of it. I'm so happy to be here to talk about the work being done by President Biden, CFA, the Urban Institute, and many of you here today to lower costs for consumer goods and services. Oftentimes, as policy advocates, our cons uh, uh, our events and speeches, our calls to action, or a public acknowledgement of a harm that Americans are experiencing. It's actually refreshing to be here today together to acknowledge the work that's being done to lower costs for everyday Americans. 
CFA has been focused on this for 56 years, and we've been pleased to support important administration initiatives that will enable consumers to thrive in the marketplace rather than be squeezed by it. We've been through a lot of price pricing fluctuation over the last few years, but thanks to the efforts of Dr. Brainerd is going to discuss here today, the economy has improved greatly in a relatively short period of time. The economy is expanding, unemployment is at, is at a record low, inflation has slowed considerably from its peak, and critically, inflation-adjusted or real disposable personal income rose 4.2% in 2023. CFA has been a thought leader and leading voice calling for lower costs for consumers across the economy in areas like food and agriculture, financial services, insurance, housing, transportation, retirement savings, and others. We all saw grocery prices soar at the start of the pandemic, far outpace, outpacing overall inflation for years. But back in February, overall food prices remained flat for the first time since April 2023, and now they've actually declined. CFA has actually a long history of working to rein in food prices, including opposing the Kroger-Albertson merger, which would lead to increased grocery prices and fewer worker protections, supporting the USDA's efforts to rein in consolidated power over farmers and ranchers, advocating for better food labeling to avoid wasting money on overpriced and deceptively marketed products, and we've supported fully funding federal food assistance benefits. CFA also has welcomed and strongly supports the administration's war on junk fees uh, in financial services, auto purchases, rental housing, internet, and cable bills. It goes across the economy so much more. We fought the proliferation of these fees for years, and it's wonderful to see the whole of government approach to ending them across the economy. Junk fees are expensive, anti-competitive, and often unfair. We've seen government-wide enforcement actions, rulemakings, and advocacy efforts which will save consumers tens of billions of dollars every single year. The CFPB's efforts to lower credit card late fees and overdraft fees alone would save consumers over $13 billion annually. We fought hard to support the administration's push to keep money in Americans' pockets instead of being drained by these junk fees, and specifically have called on Congress to protect these Herculean efforts by the administration. Insurance costs are also a major budget item for consumers, and CFA has been working to empower and push regulators to scrutinize insurance rates and rate hikes. At this point, insurance costs are not a reaction to inflation, but a driver of it, and we are relentless in the fight against incessant demands for ever higher rates. We have also called for lower premiums to reflect the reduction risk homeowners and affordable housing developers and communities invest in loss mitigation. A primary factor that drives all of the diverse areas of, ad of advocacy at CFA is the way in which communities of color and low-income families are disproportionately impacted by these higher costs. Part of the goal of lowering costs is to protect what Americans have already earned and enhance the ability to be financially secure in the future. CFA has fought to protect the Department of Labor's retirement security rule, which will improve the quality of, of advice, products, and other services that retirement plan investors receive, and is, and is estimated to save $55 billion in the small retirement market alone over the next 10 years. We've worked with the administration to fight back against excessive fees that cut into the nest eggs of retirement savers. Our America Saves initiative also provides information, tools, and tips to make it easier for people to save without shame or guilt. As I said, we are so pleased that the administration is working to rein in so many fees and costs uh, uh, that consumers are saddled with across the economy. And with all of this in mind, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Leo Brainerd, Director of the White House Na National Economic Council. Dr. Brainerd is the president's top economic advisor with a broad history of achievements during her career in academia as a leading economist throughout multiple presidential administrations and as the vice chair of the Federal Reserve. Dr. Brainerd has been a leading voice advocating for economic policies that protect working families, and we are thrilled to continue working with the National Economic Council under her leadership. So thank you.
Well, first of all, uh, thank you to both uh, Sarah and Susan for this uh, kind uh, introduction. And also want to thank both the Consumer Federation of America and the Urban Institute for all the important work you do every day on behalf of American consumers. The president sees the economy through the eyes of middle class families like the ones he grew up with in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So he knows that a lot of families are feeling squeezed by the cost of living. And that is why that is his top economic priority, lowering costs for American families. The president has directed his administration to use every tool available to lower costs in each important area of a household budget. We have a lot more work to do, but these actions are putting thousands of dollars back in families' pockets. That may not sound like a lot to the wealthiest Americans, but those savings really add up for hardworking Americans. And we're going to keep fighting to extend those actions to more Americans who stand to save thousands of dollars each year. So the question we are facing is whether we want to continue fighting to build an economy that gives families more breathing room by lowering costs, or do we want to go back to an economy that gives special interests and ultra wealthy special breaks and raises costs for everyone else? Many Republicans in Congress take every opportunity to call attention to inflation, but they haven't offered a single solution to bring costs down. Instead, some want to take us backwards, including by imposing broad tariffs on all imports, which would raise families' costs by thousands of dollars a year. The president has a comprehensive plan to lower costs across the economy, from groceries and gas to health care and housing to child care and transportation. And today, we're going to be releasing a summary of all of those actions that really show in detail the savings in each area of a family's budget. And I want to talk a little today about some of those key actions and what's at stake. We know from the data that the pandemic and the breakdown in global supply chains drove the rise in inflation that has squeezed Americans over the past few years. It was exacerbated the following year by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which also led to spiking prices on gas and food. The president, the administration, worked in partnership with the private sector to address these disruptions. Today, supply chains are largely back to normal. Inflation has fallen by about two thirds, and in many cases, input costs have actually come down. But too many companies are keeping their margins high rather than passing those savings along to consumers. In fact, 2023 saw the highest after-tax profit rate for corporations outside of the financial sector since we started tracking those data in 1947. Although we're beginning to see some signs of price reductions, there's room to do more by compressing margins further. In some industries, those elevated margins reflect weak market competition, and that's why the president's efforts to lower costs for families have gone hand in hand with his actions to strengthen market competition. The president is focused on lowering the costs that are most important to families, like groceries, which Americans see the prices of every week. Grocery prices rose during the pandemic as deliveries piled up at ports, but they increased another 11.8% in 2022 due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which spiked commodity prices. We worked with farmers, grocery stores, and shippers to improve supply chains and restore global grain markets, but even though shipping costs and global food commodity prices have declined sharply, Grocery prices have been slow to come down, and grocery store margins remain elevated relative to pre-pandemic levels. President Biden has been calling on the largest grocery chains to pass along these savings to consumers, and he used his State of the Union address to spotlight high prices set by many packaged food companies. Finally, we're seeing some grocery stores answering the president's call and lowering prices on thousands of items. 
And grocery prices may be turning a corner. Grocery prices have been down for each of the past four months, and they increased only 1% over the past year. So that's a start. But corporations need to do more to bring their prices down, and we've got to keep the pressure up. For low-income families that are struggling to pay their grocery bills, the administration has provided $2,000 more for groceries for a family of four by improving SNAP. That's lifting 3 million people out of poverty. And this year, Secretary Vilsack launched a summer EBT grocery assistance for nearly 21 million children. Instead of offering solutions, some Republicans in Congress are supporting putting tariffs on all food imports that could raise prices by 10% or more on everyday purchases like coffee, chocolate, berries, fish, bananas, and grapes. The president's also fighting to bring down health care costs. Americans pay two to three times more for their prescription drugs than people pay in other countries. That's just not right. And it was a big victory for the American people when we secured passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. It's brought insulin prices down to $35 a month for seniors on Medicare. That saves as much as $365 per month. The president wants to see those savings extended for the millions of younger Americans that use insulin. Starting next year, out-of-pocket prescription drug costs will be capped at $2,000 for seniors. That saves 19 million people $400 a year on average and many thousands of dollars for some. And the president also would like to see that cap extended to all Americans. Finally, for the first time ever, Medicare is able to negotiate lower prices for prescription drugs. We're starting with 10 drugs this year, but we want to see more drugs in the years to come. This doesn't just help family budgets. It also helps the federal budget by lowering the deficit by $160 billion over the next 10 years. Congressional Republicans have opposed those drug price reductions, even though they actually also reduce the deficit. And that would mean raising prescription drug prices for tens of millions of Americans. It's also true in the area of health insurance. The health insurance premium tax credits are saving as many as 20 million Americans, an average of about $800 per year on their health care premiums. The Republicans in Congress uniformly voted against these changes, and some are working to repeal the Affordable Care Act altogether. In addition, in response to administrative action, some of the largest inhaler producers have now given eligible Americans access to inhalers at about $35 a month. That's a savings of $1,200 per year. And we've also enacted new rules that can help millions of Americans save as much as $3,000 on over-the-counter hearing aids. Transportation is another big budget item. As we enter the summer travel season, prices at the pump are perhaps the single most frequent price that Americans see week after week. And currently, national average gas prices are below $3.50. That is not an accident. When gas prices spiked after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we took extraordinary action to increase supply. And additional actions are helping to keep gas prices in this lower range today. In fact, we're in the process of releasing a million barrels of gas from the Northeast Gasoline Supply Reserve in time for the July 4th holiday. American consumers should have choices about what kinds of vehicles they want to drive. Thanks to Inflation Reduction Act tax credits, we lowered the price of new clean vehicles by up to $7,500. And that is also supposed to project it to save families $950 per year on fuel costs. So far, we're seeing very strong uptake of this credit. We're lowering the cost of flights for many Americans. When he signed the Bipartisan FAA Reauthorization Act, the president delivered on his commitment to address family seating fees that are costly and frustrating for families with young children. This will save families with two children $200 for a round-trip itinerary. And passengers now have the right to automatic refunds for flight delays and cancellations. 
Housing costs is another major pain point, and the president has a comprehensive plan to lower housing costs. He's called on Congress to bring rent down by building 2 million affordable homes and to provide mortgage relief of up to $10,000 for millions of first-time home buyers and home buyers putting starter homes on sale if they want to upsize or downsize. Congress should act on this issue. It's a bipartisan issue. In fact, a bipartisan bill that would provide tax credits on the construction of 200,000 additional affordable units is stalled in the Senate right now after passing the House with large bipartisan majorities. We want Congress to act, but we're not going to simply uh, wait. We recently announced a cap on annual rent increases for the 2 million households in low-income house tax credit financed units, reducing the maximum that landlords can increase rent by an average of about $480 annually. We're going after rental junk fees that can add hundreds of extra dollars on top of rent each month. Already nearly 700,000 homeowners are saving about $900 annually because we reduced mortgage interest premiums for FHA-backed loans and a title insurance pilot could soon save thousands of Americans an average of $750 when they refinance their homes. And of course, uh, utility bills are really important, and we've seen major progress there with the IRA that gives uh, ongoing, that gives both upfront tax credits and ongoing savings to families for, for instance, installing a heat pump, getting a $2,000 tax credit, but then saving $500 each year on utility bills. Finally, on child care, the administration is currently saving lower income families $2,400 per year, but that needs to be extended. We would like to see this extended to 16 million families, saving the average family about $7,200 per year on childcare. That's good for families. It's good for the economy because it enables more people to go back into the workforce. Across the board, the president has called on big corporations to pass along savings to consumers, secured historic cost-cutting legislation, directed the entire administration to use every administrative tool to lower costs, and gone after hidden junk fees in nearly every area of a family's budget, from bank overdraft fees and credit card late fees to ticketing for live events. Think about what those savings mean to millions of hardworking families. That's what this is ultimately about, creating more breathing room for hardworking families. And that's going to continue to be our focus every day. So thank you very much. And I look forward to having a conversation with Sarah. Welcome back. So I failed earlier to address you as Dr. Brainerd. Uh, but that's relevant here because you have spent, you just spent nine years, I think it was, on the Fed. And uh, you've been in this business of looking at the numbers for a very long time. So I want to ask you why it is that costs are so important uh, when there are so many different aspects of uh, a consumer's uh, financial life. And yet this is the one that's really kind of sticking right now. Susan detailed earlier how many, by how many indicators, rising incomes in different areas, um, all kinds of other progress that we've made in the economy and unemployment rates and job creation. Um, and yet, uh, most people would tell you, the polls tell us, that what they experience is um, high costs, that that's their number one priority. Um, and I'm trying to understand why is it that costs seem to have, with all these different factors, such a critical impact? And is this a sort of a question of perception, or is there something that makes this really uh, uniquely important to the American family? Look, I think the cost of, the, of living is uh, very important uh, to every American family that we talk to, uh, that the president meets with. And the truth is the pandemic was extremely uh, troubling, unsettling for so many families. 
prices went up uh, by amounts that Americans simply hadn't seen uh, when the pandemic got underway. And they went up even more on things like gas and food prices when Russia invaded Ukraine a year later. And those kinds of changes, I think, really uh, created a lot of stress for working families. And that is where the president is very focused. So since the beginning, we worked with the private sector. We worked generally to fix supply chains, to get those uh, supply chain costs down, to get commodity prices down, to get input prices down. But now, of course, uh, some of the prices that consumers are seeing um, still haven't come back all the way. Uh, and that's why we're going to keep the pressure up using all the tools that we have. I think what's important uh, is we'd like to have a partner across the aisle. Congressional Republicans call attention to high inflation, but really don't offer any solutions. In fact, the only solution they put on the table uh, would actually increase the price of groceries. So we know uh, that uh, jobs are up, uh, incomes are up, real incomes are up. But we need to be working on the cost of living, which is so important to so many Americans. So when you were back at the Fed and sitting at your desk, and every month there was a new list of numbers on your desk, when you were looking at what it feels like to be an American family, what were the numbers that you looked at first? You know, it's funny. That is not how the president thinks about the economy at all. He really thinks about the economy, the way that um, the people he meets with think about thinks about it. So, you know, he really does want to know uh, what does the price of gas look like uh, today? Three below three dollars and fifty cents, down relative to last year. What about the price of chicken, also down, or the price of a gallon of milk down over the last year? These are the important things that he knows American consumers see every week. And so that is what's important to them. Um, of course, it's really important uh, to look uh, at people's balance sheets, um, so how much uh, overall breathing room there is. The balance sheet data, uh, which is terrific and comes from the Federal Reserve, actually shows that the lower, uh, the, the sort of bottom half of the income distribution has seen a 50% increase. That's inflation adjusted in wealth. Um, and so that gives us a little bit of a sense of what the strong job market has done for many American families. And if you look at their actual purchasing power, they have about $3,500 to $4,000 more uh, for the median family, according to the Joint Economic Committee. So you do want to look at all um, aspects of a family's um, uh, balance sheet and expenditures. Uh, but for the president, it's really meeting families where they are. And I do think that we also remember where we were before. So when I look at a mortgage interest rates today of 5%, I remember what I paid for my first home. But uh, in many cases, people came into the economy. I'm kind of old. Um, so many people came into the economy at a time when interest rates were well below what they are now. And so we need to, the, our benchmarks here are, are challenging ones to meet, and the pandemic really was disruptive to that. Um, so let's talk about a couple of the categories where you have focused, and let's start with the cost of drugs. The Inflation Reduction Act gave you a bunch of authorities. You detailed how many of those have been used and some of the legislative power that was created there. The, it was also the Medicaid expansion for postpartum women, which is something we've spent a lot of time working on, is really critically important for low-income women to be able to have to either not go out of pocket to get um, health care at the time when their health is so important to the health of their brand new child. Um, but it is also the case that a number of those things are at risk now. Um, so what's sort of on the, on the health care cost, what's next on your agenda and what can yeah. we be doing to move forward? Well, as, as you say, uh, health care costs are a major area of stress for family budgets. Uh, first most important thing is we need to get those premium tax credits extended $800 a year. Millions of Americans, that really makes a difference. We have to defend uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, again, uh, highest uh, level of insured uh, as a percentage of the population, that's a major achievement. 
Uh, on the um, legislative front, we have to protect the ability of uh, Medicare to negotiate those drug prices because uh, every day uh, the Inflation Reduction Act prescription drug provisions are under attack. So it's really important to hang on to the $35 a month priced insulin. It's also really important to make that available for younger Americans who uh, use insulin. The price cap, not only do we have to defend that $2,000 out-of-pocket price cap, the president wants to make that broadly available. But let me say that we're also looking all along the supply chain. Uh, there are really important um, uh, cost savings that we could see um, among middlemen in that pharmaceutical uh, supply chain. And so we're looking at all of our authorities and what we can do there. Uh, we're continuing to look at patents and making sure that there's no improper use of patents as on the inhaler issue. That can make a huge uh, price difference. And uh, generally where the taxpayer is financing some of those patents, we think that affordability is part of accessibility. Um, and just a, 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 a short Urban Institute advertisement. We released uh, at the beginning of this week um, a really comprehensive report that looked at who the expanded premium tax credits are serving and what's at stake if those were to be allowed to expire. Um, really uh, helpful data for the debate I, uh, ahead, I hope. Um, so another category we have been talking about, you were actually uh, here earlier in the year talking about the president's housing agenda. Um, he put forward in his budget and State of the Union really a, a comprehensive range of proposals for the rental market, for the very low income rental market, for uh, home ownership, trying to help um, unleash supply in the housing market. Um, and yet it is also the case that much of that agenda depends on legislative action. Um, you started to describe in your remarks some regulatory steps that you've taken, particularly around FHA and others. Um, but uh, this is a complicated market that is regulated a lot of different places. So uh, how are you spending your time focused on housing costs, which I've heard Fed officials say they think is until we get the housing cost inflation down, it's going to be hard to get to the, all the way back to where we want it to be. Yeah. So housing uh, costs are a particular pain point for American households. Uh, Congress really does need to act here. Uh, they could act, uh, the Senate could act tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we would have tax credits for 200,000 additional affordable units. Important down payment, we should get this done now. It's, it's passed uh, with bipartisan majorities in the House. Uh, generally, uh, we do have areas that we have been making a difference. So rental assistance has been an area where we've been able to do a lot. We've taken down the cost of uh, mortgage uh, premiums. Um, we have announced uh, a significant cap on rents uh, for the 2 million people living in uh, federally financed um, uh, affordable units. Um, and we also are taking action on title insurance so that for those families that are refinancing, that, that's a $750 um, uh, savings uh, right there. Uh, the American Rescue Plan uh, you know, provided a lot of flexible money uh, to states and localities. We are tracking just how much of that flexible money was used uh, for down payment assistance, for uh, supply increases. All around the country, state and local officials use that rescue plan money to address housing because they can see how acute that is. Uh, we've proposed uh, giving additional incentives to states and localities um, to use their flexibilities to make more housing land available. Um, and we would uh, provide federal uh, matching funds for that. Um, I spent, started my career in the federal government working on uh, issues relating to the closing table and the title insurance um, changes uh, you made was something that uh, got, got a cheer out of me because I do think there's a lot of unnecessary fees in that whole transaction that deserves a lot of scrutiny. Um, to, just to your point about bipartisanship, I recently heard Governor Spencer Cox, he was on a, a program with Governor Polis, and he was describing the most recent meeting of the national, maybe 
not the most recent now, but a, a recent meeting of the National Governors Association, and he said when they came to discussing housing, you couldn't tell who was an R and who was a D. This is an area in which every official has to hear from their consumers about the, um, and the constituents in their states about the degree to which housing costs is really affecting intergenerational opportunities. And so finding a way to get past our political um, differences to try to do something that would make sense for the American people. I know this is the argument the President made in the State of the Union. Um, but uh, it, it feels like there, this is a great opportunity for us to all do uh, what's right and take up some of these proposals. Couldn't agree more. If, uh, if Republicans really want to do something about inflation, please uh, join us and let's get those uh, housing tax credits passed today and let's work together on uh, reducing rents, increasing supply, providing uh, first-time home buyers with uh, mortgage interest relief through tax credits and also unlocking that starter home inventory by providing tax credits for people who want to sell. So another part of most people's uh, pocketbook expenses each month is the cost of groceries. Um, my colleagues recently put out a study that showed in 2023 uh, SNAP benefits for the lower-income Americans did not cover a cost of a meal in 99 percent of counties. That's 42 million Americans whose benefit does not cost what just a moderately priced meal uh, would be. So these higher costs are just far exceeding the rate to which our safety net um, provides support for American families. And it's not just SNAP benefits who are hurting. Um, uh, last year we saw a spike in food insecurity when the prices went up before the down that you started to describe in your remarks. Um, the, the administration fought for in the summer EBT and SNAP improvements have made an important difference and there's more that can be done. But the 2024 Farm Bill looks like it will not be a 2024 Farm Bill. And the big ex, uh, expanded child tax credit, it seems may be taken up, could be taken up this year, seems much more likely to be a 2025 uh, tax bill issue. So what else can you be doing to take on rising food costs, particularly for those with low incomes for whom this is literally a matter of sustainability? Well, let's start with those child tax credits. Again, we got those through the House with strong bipartisan support. That's an easy vote uh, for Senate Republicans to simply uh, endorse and move forward today, and that will help uh, millions of uh, American families with children. Um, we keep fighting uh, to protect, preserve, expand SNAP. Uh, we are excited about uh, the launch of uh, the summer EBT program, which will uh, bring uh, grocery uh, support for uh, millions of American families. Uh, but we know that we are going to have to keep pushing against efforts to cut back uh, these uh, really important programs for lower income Americans. And we have to keep pushing to uh, reduce grocery prices more generally. And this is one of those areas where if you look at costs, you will see that shipping costs have actually done a round trip. Uh, commodity prices are back down to about where they were at the beginning of 2021. This is an area where we should actually expect to see prices at grocery stores. They have room to fall. Grocery margins are elevated. We've not seen this level of grocery margins uh, in a very long time, there is room to pass those savings along. The president has been really pushing on this. We uh, called on grocery stores to pass those savings along. We're delighted that there are some important grocery chains that are answering the call, but we're going to keep pushing uh, to lower grocery prices. Those are so important for every American family. So we have a couple questions here from Bloomberg News, um, and I'll, I'll see if I can uh, put a couple of them to you. Um, I guess the first one is really just your view of and the administration's view of the inflation landscape. How close are we to that Fed target of 2 percent, and um, uh, what's your sense of what this rest of this year is likely to look like for the American consumer? So when I look at what uh, is happening on inflation, um, the 
index of inflation that the Fed uh, relies on, uh, the PCE index, is actually now down in around the 2.6 range. Um, you know, projections for this month are perhaps a little lower than that. So huge amount of progress there and every reason to expect continued progress uh, ahead on inflation. Uh, early in the year, uh, there were some aberrations uh, in some of the monthly prints, but we really haven't seen those continuing uh, as we've moved into the second quarter. Uh, and for uh, those reasons, we expect that inflation will continue to moderate. Um, and uh, within that, it'll be important to focus on some of those particular areas that have been stickiest. I, as I said earlier, we are actually seeing grocery prices turning a corner with grocery prices down now four months in a row, about 1% up over the past year. Um, but we have to focus on areas like healthcare and housing where we're simply not seeing enough progress. So speaking of housing, I gather that this morning the housing starts data came out a little weaker than some folks had hoped. This is also from our friends at Bloomberg. Um, and uh, the president's uh, State of the Union was clear that housing supply is a critical piece of getting affordability. Um, what was your reaction if you, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at those yet. So look, we believe that it is necessary to increase the supply of housing in order to bring rents down uh, and make housing affordable more generally. Uh, the 200000 that would be financed by the tax credit that is pending in the Senate would be a nice down payment. Uh, an additional 2 million houses that uh, would be built uh, under the President's plan would be an essential component. But of course, uh, we're looking at every tool that we have uh, to help uh, improve conditions for housing supply using, for instance, things like transit-oriented development grants um, to provide incentives to states and localities to make more uh, land available under more favorable conditions. Uh, we used a lot of the uh, recovery plan money to uh, support states and localities' plans uh, all around the country. There's so much more we can do together. This really is a federal, state, and local um, agenda. Uh, it's a bipartisan agenda, and we need to work together to improve housing affordability for Americans, which is such an important area. So we have a question uh, from an audience member who is delighted, in their word, to hear about your commitment to preserving the APTC, the premium uh, tax credits. Um, can you talk about why those subsidies are needed to begin with and uh, who to blame for the spike we've seen in health care costs? Um, what, what are the key drivers that you think are causing those to rise so much? So we have seen record enrollment uh, in uh, Affordable Care Act health insurance, and we believe that does reflect uh, a very uh, important response to the premium tax credits, which reduce the price of those health insurance plans by $800 a year. our estimates were 4 million additional American families. That sounds uh, like a good number in the ballpark. Uh, it has helped drive the uninsured rate down to around 7% in this country. That is a historic improvement. And so that's why it's so important. Um, if uh, those uh, premium tax credits are available, available, we'll continue to see um, that kind of uh, health insurance coverage, uh, which leads to better health outcomes, uh, more affordable health insurance, uh, and ultimately, we believe, drives overall health care costs down in this country. Um, there are other important costs, like prescription drugs, that we have to stay laser focused on. Again, it makes no sense that we pay, Americans pay two to three times more on comparable prescription drugs than people in uh, comparable uh, other countries. And that's why negotiating drug prices is something that was so hard fought, such a victory in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and you can see it. I mean, one of the most visible things is that people, seniors, can now get 
insulin for $35 a month. That is millions of Americans, potentially, who could get that benefit uh, if we extend it to uh, the whole population. So let me uh, do a quick follow-up on the healthcare, and then I want to go to supply chains. Uh, so on the healthcare premium costs, um, I think part of the question that we have here is, why is it that these are not for the, for the Medicaid uh, program, but these are for average people in the marketplace. Why is it the premiums are so out of reach that people are choosing without the subsidy to not be able to, to get uninsured. The, uninsured? Yeah, what's the blame essential for, for the extraordinarily high care of health so insurance? So we believe uh, that the market mechanism of competition simply doesn't work in this area, and that is why having the premium tax credits with the ACA is so vitally important that market competition alone um, is not going to drive down that cost to make it affordable. Uh, and that is the reason that these tax credits have been so vitally important. Uh, and again, uh, it's a good outcome for the U.S. economy. Uh, it's certainly a good outcome for these families uh, that can afford that health insurance. It is also important for reducing medical debt. You know, we have a number of initiatives. Um, the uh, CFPB has now proposed that medical debt not show up on credit reports, really significant source of stress for so many Americans. The uh, recovery plan funds, a lot of them were used uh, to wipe out uh, medical debt because it is such a stressor. Um, and so this is something that bipartisan um, uh, state and local officials uh, prioritized. Uh, but that medical debt itself uh, would be addressed if we retain the kinds of insurance coverage levels that we see today. So our last question also from Bloomberg comes is about supply chains again and potential global risks to supply chains. Uh, the question particularly mentions the impact of the Houthi attacks and diversions of shipping from uh, that region of the country. But I think more generally, do in an era where um, our world economy is not as stable as our, our geopolitical uh, relationships are not as stable as they have been, are the American consumers going to be experiencing price increases from these ongoing disruptions to the supply chains? Yeah. So look, I think what we learned um, over the past several years is that you can have uh, a series of very low probability events all occur around the same time period. So the global pandemic, uh, we really haven't seen uh, that kind of prolonged and universal uh, event uh, in at least 100 years. Uh, and then we coupled that with massive uh, shocks to uh, commodity markets uh, from Russia's invasion. Those kinds of events, like the attacks in the Red Sea, are ones that we all have to be better prepared for. We have learned that. And one of the benefits uh, of this period has been a whole of government effort to work with the private sector to have much greater visibility on those cho choke points, on those supply chains. And you saw that system working uh, when we had the uh, bridge, tragic bridge accident in Baltimore. We, within uh, the first several hours, were able to use uh, the Supply Chain Disruptions Task Force, Secretary Buttigieg and myself getting on the phone with all of the shippers in this area, with the um, dock workers, uh, with the local uh, businesses, uh, to quickly reroute uh, shipments so that there was uh, very little disruption to actual commerce. We uh, were using uh, data called flow data, freight logistics data. That data just didn't exist uh, before all of the supply chains work that we've done. So we do have to be more prepared. Those risks in the Red Sea, geostrategic risks more generally, are out there. Uh, we have to work with other governments, as we have been doing in the Red Sea case, but also importantly with the private sector. Uh, and we have much better mechanisms to do that under the President's Supply Chain Council today. So I know we promised to let you go, but we have two really good questions. So I'm going to do quick rounds in. The first one may be one that you haven't had a chance to, to get to because I'm going to be sitting here. Supreme Court this morning came out with a decision on the legality of a wealth tax. And I don't know if you're yet 
in a position to have an administration response or not. This was an important case, uh, and uh, that's an important decision. Okay. Um, and then the last question is um, uh, to your point about uh, competition. Um, what is the administration doing to combat algorithmic price fixing? We've seen them go on the offense recently against RealPage on price fixing on rentals, but these algorithms are really becoming widespread across the country and becoming a real um, opportunity. It's a little whack-a-mole like in uh, the ability to get to these issues. Well, I think uh, it's worth just focusing for a second on uh, this uh, problem of corporate landlords um, using uh, data sharing mechanisms uh, that happen to be algorithmic. But really, um, the question arises uh, you know, about price fixing by other means. And so what we know is important uh, is uh, that uh, it doesn't matter on what platform uh, price fixing takes place, uh, but that sharing data in a way that raises rents for consumers is something that uh, we simply are going to go after uh, using, of course, the uh, authorities the independent agencies have on that front. And to the extent that algorithms permit uh, or facilitate uh, behaviors that already are uh, clearly in violation of antitrust, uh, again, it doesn't matter the mechanism. Uh, what matters is uh, the violation of antitrust. All right. Well, they, my, my screen is now popping up with many more, but we did promise to let you get back to work. So I think we're going to have to uh, uh, call it here. But please join me in thanking Dr. Brainerd. Um, we're great opportunity. Um, I think what you just heard, just a little personal commentary for a second, um, is about the work of governing. Um, that what the White House does every day, a lot of it is um, uh, things that are uh, political in nature, national conversations and the like. But I, particularly the, the disruption after the bridge is a great example of what I remember, Lael and I shared an office more years than either of us want to admit ago um, at the White House that, that when something happens, people get to work in trying to find solutions, much of which is unseen. So we're very grateful for your service. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you everybody. Um, and let me just welcome up to the stage Thea Guerin, who is going to talk a little bit about the tool that I mentioned before, and then we'll have a discussion with CFA for our friends. Thank you all. All right, hi everyone. Thanks for being here today and thank you so much to um, the Urban Institute for welcoming us into this beautiful space this morning. My name's Erin Witte. I'm the Director of Consumer Protection at Consumer Federation of America and I'm joined with Thea Guerin from the Urban Institute. Um, Thea is an Associate Director who leads the Urban Institute's work on financial well-being and economic security. So you can see why she's here during this discussion today, very well-timed. Um, and what an incredible discussion about issues that are quite broad, but also impact us in every single part of our lives. And many of the consumers and the people that at CFA and Urban we really advocate for. Um, so Thea, I thought we could start this discussion by sort of sharing a little bit about what struck us from what we heard today, um, both in the director's speech and the discussion um, with Sarah afterwards. Um, just sort of which of these initiatives we think may have the greatest impact on American fin families' financial lives. Um, I can say what struck me, which is sort of this breadth of issues that the director discussed, right? We talked about a lot of things today, groceries, gas prices, oil, um, health care, so many different things. And yet the administration really has retained its focus on things like the cost of a gallon of milk, right? Like maintaining that incredible focus on how this impacts individuals. Um, and the fact is that even with all of the things we discussed today, we know that the administration is using a lot of tools to address things that we didn't get a chance to talk about today, like banking and financial services, worthless vehicle add-on products, um, fees and mortgage lending, telecommunications. And I think what we've seen across this breadth of issues is a message from the White House and this whole of government approach that 
frankly, enough is enough. And I think we're going to see a really big impact on consumers in a positive way. So tell me what struck you about the conversations today. Absolutely. Uh, first off, it's great to be here with you, Aaron. Thanks for the question. So I think, like you, I was struck by the range of issues that the Biden administration has set out to tackle. I was also, I think, like you, struck by the potential for impact that many of these policies have on people's financial lives. And as I was sitting there listening to Dr. Brainerd's remarks, I found myself thinking about how pundits like to say that the president actually doesn't have that much control over economic conditions. While that might be true, I think, for macroeconomic conditions, I don't actually think that's true for people's actual financial mm -hmm. lives. And so thinking about everything that the White House has accomplished, that they plan to accomplish, I'm personally feeling optimistic about the impact that these policies can have on people's financial lives. Of course, we can't let optimism have the final say, right? And so we need to conduct the research collect the data and the evidence to determine whether these policies are actually making a difference, having an impact in people's financial lives. And so while the administration, while policymakers have their work cut out for them, so do we as researchers and advocates. Yeah, and it's uh, what Urban does so well is producing such great research about a wide variety of topics. Um, and I think you know most of us here today and who are online know that according to many indicators, the economy is doing quite well. We have a stock market that's performing well. Unemployment is at a record low. Inflation has cooled and wages are rising. But despite all of these positive economic indicators, Thea, I'm curious on your thoughts about why all of these efforts on behalf of the administration are still so important. Yeah, and Director Brainerd uh, mentioned this a few times. The uh, many causes, right, of, of some of these higher costs of everyday goods and services, whether they're due to supply chain disruptions or global events, the war in the Ukraine, driven by high profit margins. The fact is that the high costs of everyday goods and services really are having an impact on people's financial lives, despite the positive economic indicators that you mentioned. And so I want to offer up a couple of examples from recent urban research. Uh, just a few moments ago, Director Brainerd talked about the elevated costs of groceries. Uh, and my colleagues, Cassandra Martinchek in the audience, as well as Dulce Gonzalez, recently published research exploring how many consumers have actually turned to various forms of credit mm -hmm. in order to be able to afford groceries. So looking at survey data from 2023, they found that more than a quarter of Americans use a credit card to pay for groceries. And this is the important part. They paid less than the full balance mm. on their credit card. So let me repeat that. More than a quarter of Americans use their credit cards to pay for groceries and carry a balance on those credit cards. Of this group, roughly 7% of these individuals did not make the minimum payment on their credit cards, meaning that they paid additional money in the form of accrued interest in order simply to put food on the table to feed themselves and their families. Director Brainerd also talked about the administration's efforts to address high health care costs in her remarks, which I personally see as less connected to some of these inflationary trends and more connected to the bizarre way that uh, America does health care. That's a conversation for another time. But for today's <laughs> conversation, uh, I think it's important to understand that when people are unable to afford their health care, whether it be routine health care or specialized health care, they often incur medical debt. And that debt, when unpaid, goes into collections. And I think it's according to the CFPB, medical debt and collections is actually the number one form of debt and collections. Like many things in our society, though, medical debt and collections is not distributed equally across communities. It's the most vulnerable communities that carry the largest amount of medical debt in collection. So looking at uh, medical debt in the state of Colorado, my colleagues Breno Braga and Frederick Blavin found that medical debt in collections is actually concentrated in communities with large immigrant mm -hmm. populations. They found that 19% of people in predominantly immigrant communities had medical debt in collections compared with just 11% of people in other communities in the state. Mm -hmm. And I find that statistic so compelling. It's, yeah. it's, very, it's, very, it's very, I think, um, um, it's, a, it's arresting because if you think of immigrants having come to the United States in pursuit of better opportunities, right. they instead find themselves saddled with medical debt, right. which can uh, put further strain on, on already tenuous financial circumstances. 
fortunately, and uh, Director Brainerd said this uh, uh, towards the end of her remarks, I think the administration is laser focused on this issue of medical debt. Uh, just the other week, she mentioned this, the CFPB proposed removing medical debt from medical debt and collections, I should say, from credit reports, which uh, I agree with her, I think would go a long way towards uh, easing the financial burden, uh, really for millions of consumers. Um, so uh, my final example relates to housing costs, which Director Brainerd said a few times is really a pain point for consumers. Looking at recent survey data from the end of last year and the beginning of this year, my colleagues here at Urban found that high housing costs are taking a toll on renters' financial well-being. They found that 68% of all renters said they were saving less than they were a year ago. 77% of renters reported cutting back spending elsewhere. And 44% of renters said they felt pressure to move homes. They found that research, the researchers excuse me, found that renters with lower incomes were more likely to report those outcomes. But even a significant percentage of renters with incomes above 100,000, so households that we might consider uh, higher income, mm -hmm. still reported those outcomes, showing that many, many Americans are struggling with the higher costs of housing. Mm -hmm. So Erin, back to your original question. <laughs> Why are the administration's efforts to address these costs so important? It's simply that these costs are continuing to really affect the financial lives of, of so many people in this country. Yeah, and as you've alluded to with just your three points, we know there's a lot more, but there are so many components to consider as we're thinking about financial security, economic justice, um, and the financial well-being of individuals in our country. Um, at the beginning, CFA CEO Susan mentioned a lot of the advocacy work that CFA has been doing to lower costs in housing, insurance, banking, auto purchases, um, air travel, groceries, sort of across the board, and really to focus on making sure that consumers can keep money in their pockets instead of having it drained out through these practices. Um, you know, at CFA, we're a bit unique. We have uh, advocates that focus on different subject matters. Um, my subject matter is consumer protection, so it's a bit broad, but we have folks that focus on retirement savings, um, insurance, financial services, food services, and things like that. And it's clear based on your comments, based on advocacy at organizations like CFA, that someone's financial well-being is about much more than just the dollar amount in their bank account. Right? It's sort of this interconnectedness across lots of different parts of the economy. And people's financial lives are inherently really complex and impacted by a lot of things that we would never have time to consider even if we were here all day adequately. Um, access to health care, child care, education, transportation, um, all of these things really shape how people perceive their financial well-being too and their ability to participate in the economy. And sometimes I think uh, even consumers, right, like people who are not policy nerds like us, um, may not appreciate sort of this interdependency of all of these factors in their lives. Um, so I don't, what do you think about that? <laughs> I think you said it so well, Erin. I think as policymakers, as researchers, it is absolutely essential that we consider the holistic nature of people's financial lives, the many facets, the many issues that we've talked about this morning that collectively comprise and shape uh, an individual's financial well-being. Fortunately, the Urban Institute has launched a new tool to help us do just that. Uh, so this tool, you can see a, a screenshot behind me, uh, allows researchers to browse and search amongst a list of, a curated list of more than 300 financial well-being metrics identified from nearly a dozen publicly available data sources. Included in the tool are core measures of financial well-being, things like uh, a household's assets or debts, as well as some of these contextual factors that we've been talking about that shape an individual's financial well-being. For example, whether a household has experienced uh, a financial disruption due to a climate-driven event or a natural disaster in the past year. Users can use the tool uh, to filter metrics by data source, by geography, as well as by tag or by topic. Uh, and additional information, such as the unit of analysis, the survey frequency, and time frame is provided at the data source level. And we hope that by helping researchers to better understand really the wealth of data that they mm -hmm. have available to them, by helping them to work across publicly available surveys, uh, that this tool can inform research that advances solutions really rooted in that holistic understanding of people's financial well-being. 
Yeah, it, this seems like a really useful tool. Um, at places like CFA, I have colleagues that I can maybe call and ask this question of. We've got a pretty good working relationship with each other. And it's really nice to be able to complement that work with a publicly available tool like this that sort of centralizes all of this information in sort of a one-stop shop. Um, can you give us an example of how we can use this tool? Absolutely. <laughs> so let's, uh, let me give you an example related to what we've been talking about, inflation. Mm -hmm. Um, so one could use this tool to search for the keyword inflation, related topics to inflation, and be presented with uh, roughly, I think it's half a dozen or so, measures that align with this topic across uh, various surveys. And so keep in mind that the statistics I'm about to share with you from these various surveys, are, they're from a few years ago, and so sentiments may have changed. Uh, as inflation has, has cooled in recent years. Uh, but the tool would then direct you to the Financial Health Network's Financial Health Pulse, for mm -hmm. example, where you could find that 29% of all households in 2021 reported feeling stressed by inflation. Turning to the Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey, another pulse survey, you could find that households with low incomes were more likely to be worried that inflation would persist and that roughly 89% of households with incomes below $50,000 said they were concerned inflation would continue through 2023. And then to assess the real world implications of these sentiments, you could consult the Federal Reserve's SHED survey and find that in response to inflationary trends in 2023, 51% of households reduced their savings, 59% delayed a major purchase, 18% said they worked more or got another job, and 15% said they increased their borrowing. And so alone, each of these statistics is an interesting data point, an interesting statistic on its own. Together, though, they paint a really rich and complex portrait of people's financial lives. Yeah, and I think this is a really, um, it's, it's a nice complement to the discussion that we've had today, which shows how the administration is, is well aware of these, these facts, right? And they've been really responsive and trying to understand how people feel about this and really taking decisive affirmative action to make sure that their actions really reflect what people understand and trying really hard to put that money back in people's pockets. And I can see how this tool would be really complimentary, like I said, to the work that we do at CFA. We could answer questions like, the interrelatedness of these factors, like how rising costs of housing, healthcare, and food affect people's long-term financial security, um, developments regarding student loans and medical debt, how that affects people's ability to manage their debt overall, and things like even climate disruptions, the impact that that has on, on households. Um, so this is a really useful tool. I'm really excited to dig in and use it. I'm so glad to hear it. And you know, we really see this tool as being a starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope to enhance it uh, over time. Uh, we have some enhancements that we would like to do. We'd like to add more data, more sources, potentially data from public or proprietary, excuse me, proprietary or private sources, uh, potentially provide more normative guidance mm -hmm. to help users uh, select or prioritize the most relevant, the most important financial well-being metrics for their research, uh, as well as to potentially include data actually on the back end through the tool so that uh, this can really serve as, as a one-stop shop for financial well-being research. We hope that all of you who use the tool will provide us with feedback. We really want this tool to meet your needs uh, and the, the needs of the, of the wider field. Um, so at the end of the day, we really see the tool as um, hopefully being another um, asset right, that researchers and policymakers have to advance solutions that promote equity and enhance financial well-being. So, Yep. On that, yep, on that uh, <laughs> forward-looking note, uh, I think it is time for us to wrap up. It's really been a jam-packed, uh, wonderful morning of discussions. On behalf of the Urban Institute, I would like to thank all of our speakers this morning, uh, Director Brainerd from the National Economic Council, uh, as well as Susan Weinstock, Erin Witte from the Consumer Federation uh, of America. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Urban staff, uh, the events team, the communications team, the AV team, the government affairs team, uh, all of the individuals who made this event possible, who pulled it off so expertly and yes, on <laughs> relatively uh, short notice. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank all of you, the attendees who were able to join us in person uh, and virtually for the event. We're so grateful that you could be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.